I think it'll be pretty obvious. Uh, good morning, good morning, everyone. Those of you who are joining us, thank you very much for joining us. So, Sia Justin, would you mind introducing yourself? Hello, yes, my name is uh, Justin Watkins, and at present, I am Professor of Burmese and Linguistics at SOAS in the University of London, um, which is a small specialised university where we um, work on humanities and social science subject, subjects in focusing on Asia, Africa and the, and the Middle East. Um, and my responsibility is there to teach Burmese and linguistics and I've been there a long time, since 99. Wonderful. And um, I'm Kenneth Wong. I teach uh, beginning and intermediate Burmese at UC Berkeley, and I also translate a lot of Burmese poetry, and I write articles about Burma. I think uh, details are in our biographies that have been published. So if you need more information, you can look. You can certainly look either Justin up or uh, look me up. But I thought we'll start, Sia yeah, Justin, today by talking about. The, the great loss that uh, the Burmese learner and teaching community have just suffered this uh, recently, and that's the loss of the passing of great Sia John O'Kell. You have a closer relationship than I do. Would you maybe talk about him a bit? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I could talk about John for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. spent, uh, I spent more than half my life in, a, in quite a close working uh, friendship with him. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a bit difficult, it's all, all very raw. But yeah, we first met, um, uh, you know, well, maybe it's just some information first here. John, um, for those who don't know, and I think anyone who, who knew him probably does know by now, but John passed away um, on the 2nd of August. Um, he had been diagnosed with a brain tumour in, um, in the, at the end of June. And about a month before that, maybe two months before that, he started to um, experience fatigue. So the, the illness... Um, uh, took him from us very, very quickly. Um, happily, he experienced no pain of any kind and had time to say farewell to his loved ones um, and slipped away very quietly after he, after a couple of days in a coma. So um, a very graceful end. Um, and it reminded me, actually, in some ways, of the ways that John would leave a party. So in recent years, so uh -huh. John was 86 um, in June, Mm -hmm. He uh, he would often find, and had some uh, deafness, some problems with his ears, he would find that uh, parties, say, after um, a long, hard day teaching Burmese in Yangon, loud parties would be a little bit too much and not very interesting for him because he couldn't yeah. really hear anything. But of course, he was always the star um, star guest um, and quite difficult to leave without spending another half hour saying goodbye to everyone. So he had a great talent for just disappearing very quietly <laughs> and quickly before mm -hmm. anyone really notice what was going on and I feel in a way that that is what he has just done and um, mm. by leaving us tragically early I think we all thought he would be here forever but of course um, that has yeah. been so it's deeply deeply sad um, and just to very briefly my own relationship with him I turned up at SOAS in 94 to do um, a master's degree in phonetics um, and my supervisor suggested, I'd done Chinese as an undergraduate, and my supervisor suggested that it might be fun if I had a look at Burmese, I had to do a project on the sound system of an Asian or African language, and it could have been anything. I could have been given Amharic or Zulu or you know, Persian, anything. But she thought Burmese might be interesting because of the relationship um, with Chinese. So she did that. She put us in touch and um, she put me in touch with John O'Kell. And I thought it would also be interesting if I learned a bit of the language, if I was going to study the sounds of it. So I did the first year, the beginner's course at SOAS that year. And um, John and I got on really, really well. And um, I then, the following year, was off doing, I didn't study with him again after that, but I was, um, he was my PhD supervisor in part for a project and um, I was working on the WA, the phonetics of WA in northern Myanmar and southwestern China. And um, we stayed in touch and then one day he said, um, at the time, um, university lecturers in the UK had to retire when they, when they turned 65. And he was due to turn 65 in 99. So he said a few years before that, I think it was in 1996, 90, 96, um, it might be worth um, keeping an eye on your Burmese and make sure you don't forget it. Because mm -hmm. um, I've done some field work in um, northern Myanmar by this stage for the WA project. 
he said because actually in 99 there might be a job to apply for and it there was <laughs> and i was lucky enough to get it um, and i think it's so as they were quite interested in someone that could teach language and linguistics so in 99 i um uh was lecturing burmese and linguistics and um, have been at SOAS ever since but at that point john felt you know at 65 it was much too young to stop uh, to stop working having devoted his life to teaching Burmese and in the course of this conversation I'm sure we'll be mentioning several of the you know, groundbreaking essential uh, works that he has left us with for the study and teaching of Burmese. Um, but he decided at that point, um, uh, just in around 99, 2000, that it would be a good idea to start running short Burmese courses. He started off doing them in, in Chiang Mai, where he could attract um, people who worked inside, as we said then, inside Burma and also near the border and in the region. Um, and they became very popular and he sort of stepped away from SOAS to let me get on with my thing. And then in 2008, um, a student, Ruth Bradley Jones, who had both taught Burmese um, in preparation for her working at the British Embassy in Yangon, we had trained her in, uh, in Burmese. She said, there is a lot of demand for um, the two of you to go to Yangon and start doing short courses there. So we started planning that in, 90, in 2008, we couldn't go because Nagas happened. So we then started instead in 2009. And um, last year was the, was the last time that we did it in Yangon. This year, we went online um, for a three week course. And over the years, those courses became wildly popular. We had 120 people, I think, online this year which was great. Um, and um, from humble beginnings, when we all had to sort of cluster around, hoping that the police wouldn't come around and uh, round us up and take us to the airport, and we would all be completely terrified of mentioning the word Aung San Suu Kyi in class in case we got arrested. Right. Right. It was all a very, very different time. But how things, how things change, I think the, when the lid came off in around 2014, 2015, we suddenly got massively increased numbers. Um, and we've, for a number of years now, been joined by uh, Yu Yu Kang, who teaches Burmese at Cornell. At Cornell, that's right. Online, yeah. online this year too, we were joined by my SOAS colleague, who does uh, is a part-time uh, uh, Burmese teacher with me at uh, SOAS, uh, Fazin, who um, who joined us online this year. So it's it's turned out to be a good um, format. Um, so yes, that is um, how John and I have stayed in touch. We very much enjoyed flying out to Burma together um, and having great fun. And as, as everyone who knows him, I yes, I'm being slightly careful not to um, say things that are going to make me emotional. But he had, I think, one of the nicest uh, themes in all the amazing tributes that we've seen written about him online is that he had this ability to make you feel as if you were the most important person, that he had your, you had his full attention and that he was fascinated in whatever you were saying. And he had an incredible way of uh, um, listening, giving helpful suggestions and um, connecting you to people who he thought might be able to help you with what you were doing. He was just incredibly generous in all sorts of uh, ways, intellectually, emotionally and, um, and physically. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And we will miss him very, very much indeed. Um, there we are. I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I'm so glad that you're able to share the, uh, that part of John because I've never had that pleasure of meeting John personally. Only in ex, uh, email exchanges, we have uh, asked questions and uh, we discussed some of the uh, quirkiness of Burmese language. I distinctly remember the first time I was, um, I, I found out that I'd be teaching Burmese at UC Berkeley. The first thing I did was, um, well, first I was outlining my lesson, and then I came to the lesson about uh, teaching numbers, and I suddenly realized I have to explain to the students why uh, the the word ja keep shifting consonant in the pronunciation. When I say the ja, I say the ja, but na ja, thong ja, and then suddenly chao ja, le ja, nga ja. That word keep changing from ja to ja, ja to ja, back and forth, and I thought. How am I supposed to explain that? And what are the rules? And then I started looking things up, doing research, and I found the answer in John's book. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, you spend, yeah. In the old days, you used to spend the students would have to spend half their first year counting things to get them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in that case of jet versus jet, it's one of the differences that people find really hard to hear at the beginning, anyway. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but but that is essentially one of those. This is just one of the many many difficult things about Burmese language that is difficult to explain that John has indirectly through his book. Yes, he explained yeah. to my students, and uh, even though he's gone, in a way, the legacy remains. Even though you said John would have liked to very quietly slip away, I suspect that the books that he left behind for us is going to be with us for a long time, and it'll remain resources for many of the many students for a long time, teachers as well. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, um, I mean, I think we're going to talk about some learning and teaching resources a bit later on as part of this um, conversation. True. So not, what's, yes. on, what's on the menu next? We haven't got, if anyone, if menu anyone next. is watching us and if anyone has any questions. <laughs> well, I can see that there are some comments that are coming in. Oh, are there? That's right. And then I can, this is the first time I'm doing it. And, uh, and I see that in the corner of my console, there are, there is a number 72 next to a little ear, uh, an eye symbol, oh, wow. which means okay. there are two people watching. <laughs> That's good. Great. Yes, uh, Hello, everybody. Please do feel free to um, ask questions or make comments. Um, I think Ken and I are in uncharted new territory. <laughs> but I think That's it's, right. you wanted, Ken, if you wanted to try this out today, because we might yes. use it for more specific things in the future. Um, I, you know, it seems like there is a need for it, and if people are going to be um, um, under lockdown, so to speak, for a considerable amount of time, we might as well make the best of our time and their time by sharing what we know. Uh, on the menu, uh, we thought we'll start by discussing how we feel about learning the script. Is it a good idea to uh, start from the get-go and learn the script, or you put it up for a while? Uh, before I share my thoughts, yeah, what about your thought? Well, if I had a pound or a dollar, or probably not a jet because they're not worth as much, but a pound or a dollar or a euro, for every time I've had a student who has spent a considerable amount of time learning the language and has mm -hmm. got to a stage where they they've plateaued and they need to get to the next level. Um, and they have bitterly regret um, not learning the script at the beginning. Um, then I would um, be able to buy myself a meal probably. But um, mm. the, the, the point being that um, for students like that, and there are many people in that category that I can think of, um, they usually are dependent on writing their own sort of uh, transcription to remember words and take notes and learn vocabulary. And of course, as we all know, there is no easy way to represent accurately the sounds of Burmese in transcription, um, uh, unless you are um, prepared to learn a system that's so complicated, you might, have, might as well have learned Burmese scripts anyway. Um, but what I would say is that um, at that stage, people are often reinforcing um, errors because they're unable, to, for example, you might have a, a large number of words who will, which would turn out the same in an informal transcription that a, that a sort of um, functionally a fairly fluent speaker without the script might uh, might use. And that becomes a real handicap become, because it becomes a block to hearing the differences between words that might just have a, uh, a tone difference or a vowel difference or something like that. Um, and I think too it's quite useful to turn it on its head and think, you know, if you were learning English, would you would it make any sense at all to learn English without uh, learning the English writing system? And I think you know we like to say that that's a massively different situation because in, everybody knows the English writing system, but it's not really. It makes no sense at all to learn a language without learning to read and write it um, to some degree. Um, and the only exceptions I would make for that are people who are just going to visit the country once and just need a phrase book and a few phrases. That's fine. But if you're if you're going to learn the language, and that means learning the language and investing something in it, and uh, with Burmese you do kind of need to jump in for a while to to learn the basic structures and how the language works. That takes a bit of time. Um, then there's uh, you know the the first thing you have to do to get a handle on everything is uh, is learn the script. 
and without that you are um, condemned to what do they say wading in sauerkraut um, and being stuck in <laughs> stuck in confusion and ambiguity and all those horrible things so learn the script is my answer you know i i, I agree with you see if somebody is just somebody's purpose for learning Burmese is just going to the country for two weeks or maybe even a month or so and all they want to do is just introduce himself and uh, ask for prizes or chit chat and talk about their family and things like that and they'll leave it at that at that very superficial level maybe they can get away with uh, learning the script because learning the script does take considerable amount of effort and time investment in it but the moment one starts to get into the idea of maybe talking deeply about culture or the differences in two different countries or talk about emotions and things like that, um, shall we say at the beginning level of the intermediate learner's uh, journey, at that point, not, le not knowing the script is a serious handicap. I think that it's a handicap long, long before then. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's worth... I think we need to, you know, learning the script takes about um, 20 hours, something like that. It's not a huge investment. Um, you can learn the basics of it in, um, you know, in our short two-week courses. We have um, the way we generally teach the script is in a is in a some material that breaks it down into eight eight chunks. So with with 10 sessions, 10 hour-long sessions, and then maybe the same amount of time time outside class spread over two or three weeks. You can learn the basics of the script, so it's not a huge investment. You know, it needs to be done, um, and it's uh, you know it's something that you don't have to do if you're learning a language that has the same script. But I think we need to be very difficult not to say that, not to perpetuate. Um, uh, and I don't want to lay this on, lay this on too thick, but there are some quite unhealthy um, Orientalist myths out there that languages with a with a, a funny Asian writing system are impossible to learn. That languages of Asia are have no grammar, um, that languages with tones are impossible to learn. It's just not true. It just means that these languages are different from English and that's fine because the world is linguistically diverse and culturally diverse. And that's just the way it is. So if you're going to learn Burmese, I don't think it's helpful to um, encourage people to pick and choose, you know, either learn the language or don't learn the language, but don't learn the bits of it that you've decided for yourself um, will be, um, more will be easier um, and reject the bits that you think will be harder because actually you might it might not necessarily be the case those aspects of the language won't necessarily be harder it's just you need some help and you're not prepared um, to approach them because they're unfamiliar to you and that's fine you know that's why there are teachers to help and we we know how to teach the script um, and uh, and we've been doing it very successfully to hundreds of students so um, don't uh, don't be put off by things. Don't be afraid um, of things that are uh, unfamiliar. One of the one of the comment that I notice here is that um, what is the hardest uh, what is the hardest aspect of learning the script? And I would I would imagine um, learning the script itself is not a difficulty as you might have put it if you're willing to put in the effort. For, certainly for English learners. Uh, because of the unfamiliarity of it and the system in which it put together sounds and things like that, it may seem difficult. But to me, it seems relying relying on romanization, the imperfect kind of representation system that we have to represent Burmese sound, is uh, in the long run, it's more harmful than one might think. Um, it cannot make a distinction between what's like Tangji and Tangji, for example, because the, the English T would always say, sound the same way, but in Burmese, if you don't make a distinction between an aspirated consonant and an unaspirated consonant, your meaning invariably change, and you could be saying something that is quite embarrassing. Well, yeah, or like, what's the real, yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right, and I think that... Um, Learning the script helps you discriminate between sounds that at the beginning of learning Burmese might be hard to tell apart. And, and yeah. the fact that they are represented clearly and unambiguously by different spellings um, helps. And the best, the most efficient way of writing the sounds of Burmese down is in Burmese script without, uh, without a doubt, because 
the two systems have grown up together. But I think um, one of the frustrations um, with learning any language, and this isn't really about Burmese, but any language where the, write, the writing isn't uh, necessarily an accurate representation of exactly how it's pronounced, which of course is true in spades in English, and in English it's much worse, um, but that in Burmese there can be several ways of writing the same vowel or that sometimes um, syllables might lose their tones and their vowels in pronunciation and you just have to know how to pronounce certain words before you can have a go. But you know, the, the, the longer you are reading and writing Burmese, the more familiar the patterns of the language and the more predictable those things, those things become. Um, and of course, you know, if, again, if you turn the situation around, is it acceptable to learn English and not really bother how to spell things correctly? No, you need to learn spelling if you're going to be literate. And I think we can all aspire to be literate in Burmese um, to the extent that we've learned the language, because um, that's that's a, a normal and uh, a normal goal to, to set for ourselves. One of the one of the, one of the comments comment that, that um, I'm, I'm hearing, hearing some echo echoes somehow. somehow. Um, one of the comments that came through is that. Um, is it important to remember? It is important to know the name of the consonant themselves. I guess mm -hmm. that's getting to the names like Ga, Ji, Ka, Gui, Da, Ying, Gao, Da, Ying, Mo, Ta, Sin, Tu. It may not be necessary, but actually, yeah, it, it actually describes the shape of the character itself. If one understands what the names those, what the names are, so those names actually do help people I remember. I, what I'd say about that is that I think it's good to choose when it's the right time to learn them because yeah. one of the most dispiriting things for people who start Burmese is to be burdened at the very beginning by this huge list of extremely complicated names for, for letters and yeah. um, yeah. it just takes up too much bandwidth at a time when your energies should really be devoted to, to doing sort of more fundamental uh, the fundamental nuts and bolts of the language but at some point around the sort of first or second year mark, it's quite a good thing, you know, in it, eventually you'll wish you had learned them. So there, there is a right time to do it when I think you can do it without it being too onerous a task and where some more of the names will be meaningful straight away because you'll know some of the vocabulary. Um, and it is, it is a really useful thing to, um, to be able to do. And um, once you get to a certain level of ability in Burmese, it seems strange to Burmese speakers if you don't know the names of the letters because it's a normal thing to know. So you, do, right. you do it at some point. Yeah. Uh, especially near near the um, near the advanced level of the intermediate level, and certainly at the advanced level, if you ask the Burmese teacher how does how should I spell this particular word, that teacher is going to say yeah. that spelling system. They are going to say toss into you know. Uh, uh, sangkat, and if you don't know what a longitin sangkat is, and if you don't know which one is a tasin to, then then you have trouble following that kind of instruction. And the only the other thing is too is that if you think about the name like tasin to, it actually has the meaning because it it is a reference to it is a reference to the elephant feathers, the the two rings that people used to use to hold the elephants in place, and that's why it is known as tasin to like that. So, yeah, it, it, in a way, um, if you're suddenly a linguist with a curiosity for the etymology of words and why certain shapes are called that way, it's a very interesting study in itself, the names themselves, to me. I did, by way of anecdote, have we got, how, how much time have we got, by the way? Does, can, can I tell a story? Oh, please do, by all means. Yeah. <laughs> So when, for a while, quite a long time ago now, I was I was inter getting really interested in sign languages, and I did a bit of work um, investigating the sign language that um, is mostly centered in Yangon. There are two two sign languages in uh, Myanmar, um, and one is sort of Yangon based. And my um, the person that I was in a lot of contact with at the time um was explaining to me how at one point there had been a um, a finger spelling a way of spelling um the letters of burmese um at the deaf school at the mary chapman school and uh, he said well, unfortunately it's been replaced in the educational curriculum by people from outside who've kind of imposed um a finger spelling system from american sign language onto burmese which is a great shame because burmese letters have very good sort of shapes that fit 
into, That's um, right. into our fingers quite well. Um, and he said that, that you know, he had a few friends who were still able to do the finger spelling system and what they used it for in class. So basically they were doing the primary school curriculum and learning the texts from the first and second standard readers um, and learning to be literate in Burmese, even though they were deaf. And um, he said that they would, when the teacher was facing the, um, the blackboard, they would be able to sign and spell the text to each other silently behind her. And they got very, very good at it. So he took me to visit one of his uh, friends and I had them spelling words back and forth to each other, um, which they hadn't had the chance to do. So they were getting, it was very sort of reminiscent of their school days, but it was absolutely wonderful how quickly they could spell words using their fingers um, because the shapes fit, uh, fit very nicely with uh, the, 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 the subject. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. there is a whole, yeah. a whole thing. Anyway, sorry, that's a digression. No, uh, there's one oh, there's question one. that I thought will take, Sia. Um, has Google Translate accelerated people's ability to learn the script or make them lazy? Um, to me, there are both pluses and minuses to Google Translate. It's certainly, as, a, as an automatic machine translator, it, it leaves a lot to be desired about its accuracy in how it translates the meaning, but you go ahead. Um, well, yeah, I think I think that. So on the one hand, my colleague at SOAS who teaches Tibetan said, "Well, you know, it might not be very good, and in fact, it might be pretty bad, but at least it's there." Yeah. So it's good in a way that um, Burmese does have a little foothold in the stable of uh, Google Translate languages. Um, so that's a good thing. But I think it's I think they may have turned it on a little bit prematurely, or perhaps not devoted resources to developing it that they might have continued to do because it doesn't seem to have improved a great deal since it was turned on which is maybe three or four years now i don't know it's, it's been there for a while now yeah um, and it's good for sort of single items of vocabulary so words that only have one meaning so if you wanted to look up um you know reading glasses or something like that you'd probably get a good translation or a verb like throw um you might do quite well so using it as a dictionary but one of the big problems with Google Translate is that, for Burmese, is that it has, it seems to have not bothered to engage with the fact that Burmese is diglossic. You have a conversational and formal, uh, you have conversational formal varieties of the language which have diverged over the centuries. Um, and what you get back from Google Translate, if you're translating into Burmese, is a, a very strange mixture of the two. And the pronouns that are used, of course, won't be appropriate to the context. So it's not really useful for that much unless you want to just shove a text through it and get some useful vocabulary out of it. That, it can be good for that kind of bulk skim reading, but it's not in itself a useful translation tool. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Kenneth? It, it, um, it, it has some uses, I think. Uh, it, it, specifically to the, the question that came up is that uh, it, it, I find that it does encourages people to learn to type. Because in order to put words into Google Translate, you need to learn to type. So that in, in inspire people to learn at least to type in a Unicode compliant fashion. That's a good That's thing. That's true, actually. And as a driver of the promotion of Unicode, Google has been helpful. You know, they didn't mm. cave, like Facebook did, and, and sort of put up with um, Zorgi for a long time. They, it's like, if, okay, if, we, if we're going to have Burmese, it's got to be Burmese text encoding that works. So, right. yeah, so that's been good, sure. And the other thing that is good, I think, is if you have a chunk of Burmese text and you are having difficulty figuring out how to pronounce the whole thing and read it properly, if you dump it into Google, Ta uh, Google Translate and have a speech to text, text to speech reading, it does read it out for you. Uh, the only thing I yeah, notice is, is Google. Yeah. The only thing I notice is that Google Translate is not very good at doing the consonant shifting that native speakers will do. So in a way, yeah. you get an overly correct kind of pronunciation that is something of a different form from the way a native speaker would read it. I think it's something that could be fixed with some, some kind of simple programming, but um, we hope that yeah. at some point Google will come to it. Yeah, if they, it would be nice if they threw some more resources at it. It could be improved. It sounds to me, yeah, when you do the text-to-speech, which you're, is, thank you for putting that out because it is good, it, it sounds like a, a sort of fluent second language speaker of the language. It sounds a bit like someone from Shan State or something. <laughs> some, people yeah. did, some people did thought that they hired uh, an ethnic uh, ethnics, um, 
uh, speaker to record those. And I kind of pointed out, no, more likely it's because Google Translate cannot figure out how to do the consonant shifting that native yeah. Burmese speakers do. Yeah. Um, While we're here, actually, so if people yeah. do want a, a useful um, uh, online translator, I'm going to promote, this is not, not um, my own work, but there's a fantastic app called Voice Tra. So V O I C E T R A. I have it too. I have it too. Yes. Yeah. Which really does um, a fantastic job. It limits itself to translating single sentences. Um, and it has a, a, an interesting range of languages, but Burmese is one of them. So, for example, if you give it an English sentence, it'll translate that sentence into Burmese and then back into English. So you get a back translation, which is a great way of checking if the Burmese translation is something approaching what you were looking for in the first place, or if something's gone a bit sideways. Um, and yeah. it's a fantastic resource for checking your own pronunciation too, because you can dictate your Burmese into it. It's got um, speech to text. And yes. um, occasionally in classes, I've got students to read, to check whether they've got the vowels right by reading words into voice track to see if it transcribes them correctly. So you can have a lot of fun with it. And, and the, the, the quality of the translations is really very high. Um, so they're, they're getting it right. And I believe that they're harvesting all the data of translation searches that users put through the app to improve the quality. Um, and the yeah. fact that there is that back translation is a really good sort of iterative improvement loop for automatic translation systems. It's really impressive. I, I like it very much. I, th I think that's the nature of machine learning that we should point out. You know, if we say that it's not perfect yet, so we're not going to use it. If nobody uses it, then the machine doesn't have sufficient input to mm. get better at it. So somehow, in a way, even though it's imperfect, I'd like to encourage people to try to use it with the understanding that right now uh, it's not that reliable yet for accuracy. But over time, uh, the machine gets more practice at it, and the algorithm gets better, and I hope that it'll get better. Um, if it's okay with you, Sia, we'll move on, and we'll move yeah. on to the talk about talking about how to how to use the appropriate kind of language for polite situation, formal situation, casual situation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What, is there any general rule of thumb you can give people on how to how to do this? Well, so um, I guess we're not talking here about the formal register, the formal written register of the language. We're not. Are we talking about that or not? You know, that's a good question because okay, yeah. formal doesn't necessarily mean literary. Literary is the written form where we say things like chano maneka tamensa ba di manepian tua ba mi and that sort of thing. Okay. That's a literary. We're not talking about that. Okay. Because that, I, mean, that, that, is, that I think it, I mean, maybe what's relevant there is that there are elements of that formal register of the language which, which slip True. into spoken language. And of course, it's not two languages, it's one language with two nearly distinct varieties which ble bleed into each other to some to some degree yeah. um, and yes yeah, so at some point we could I mean we could have a conversation about at what point Burmese learners should tackle that written the literary style, yeah, that's a literary style because you have to do that at some point too but getting that right is, is quite important but as, as I think one of the one of the easy ways in to start thinking about um, when talking levels of formality in, in Burmese is to think about pronouns and the way people address each other. Mm. Um, and there's one, um, and how pronoun choice, whether it's whether you're using an actual pronoun or a kinship term or some other um, uh, sort of role like teacher or something like that, um, I think that's quite a good way in because it can, it can encourage you to start listening to, when you're listening to Burmese people speak to each other, you can start listening to how they encode their relationship, um, their social relationship by pronoun choice. And of course, it's useful when you're reading too to, to work out what pronouns are people using for I and what pronouns they're using to, for you when they talk to each other, because we, it's completely straightforward in English and massively complex <laughs> in Burmese. Um, and the other anecdote I quite like to tell people too, and anyone who's heard this in one of my classes before, I'm sorry, is one time I took my uh, mother to uh, Myanmar and we were having dinner with some uh, Burmese friends and I asked her to pass me something, let's say the salt, and she passed it to me and I said, thank you. And my Burmese friend looked over and said, why did you thank her? 
she's your mother. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, you know, I said, thank you, because she passed me the salt. What's strange about that? But of course, in a Burmese perspective, it might have looked as if we'd had some argument or I was trying to show my distance because the relationship between a son and his mother should be one where no thanks is necessary for passing the salt. In fact, not saying thank you is a way of demonstrating your intimacy. And, That's and, the default. Sorry? That's a default. That's as a default. A, yes, exactly. Yeah. And if you suddenly start being polite to someone who you would normally have a close relationship with, um, then something's not right. So the idea that increasing um, level of politeness or formality in your speech is also a way of putting social distance or True. either horizontally. Um, so in linguistics, we talk about pronouns of power and solidarity. So it could either be a vertical power relationship or a uh, uh, more or less intimate in a, on a sort of horizontal plane. Um, and that, I think, is quite a good way of pronouns and um, levels of politeness are quite a good way of starting to think about think about that. L certainly, it's, it's, um, it's relatively easy to figure out that there is a set of pronouns that you use for your close friends, like uh, me or name for you and na for I. And then for respectful situations where chano or chama, depending on gender for I, and kanya or shin for you, depending on the other person's mm. gender. But what English speakers often have a difficult time understanding is that Burmese native speakers actually, um, instead of using the word you, they tend to use the name of the person or mm. a kinship term more. If I were to be asking Sia about your morning in English, I would say, when did you wake up this morning? What did you have for breakfast? What will you be doing this afternoon? The word you keep appearing. If a Burmese speaker does that to you, it's it sounds really rude. Instead, yeah. I'm more inclined to say personal about Kamya, yeah. Something very, it sounds to me like uh, I'm interrogating you. I'm more likely to say, Sia Maneka Benanai Tale, or Justin Maneka Benanai Tale, Justin Nani Basamle, Sia Nani Basamle. I'm intent, I'm inclined to use a relationship term like a ko, or a professional term like Sia, or your name itself as a yeah. substitute, you. And yeah. that actually. But that's interesting. So like, you have. For addressing me, you have those three options, right? You can call me Justin, yes. you can call me Ago, and you can call me Seah. Yes. And so what might make the difference, I guess, in this um, context, where the fact that we're both Burmese teachers is relevant, it makes sense for me to call you Seah and you to call me Seah, right? Um, but outside, away from the glare of um, <laughs> social media publicity, we might be more likely to call each other Ago or something like yes. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's not identify who is older, shall we? Publicly. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm fifty. I'm fifty next month, so. Um, ah, um, then I deserve, my, call, my call. Yes. I deserve to be called. I deserve to be called, and you'll be Neely. <laughs> Neely. Yeah. But it's not. It's not very different. I don't think is it. Yeah, yeah. that's that's not a big difference. But that's a good point because um, the rule of thumb for me is I always tell them. In order to safely use the casual pronouns me or ne and nga for I, one, you have to have a pretty close relationship with that person. You have to get to know that person very well. And two is that there is not a huge age difference between the two of you. Yeah. And the other thing is that in the social hierarchy, shall we say, you're not in a situation where a teacher and a student or a boss and a subordinate or a minister and an underling and things like that, because if you meet all those three conditions, I would say it's pretty safe to go with the casual pronoun. If yeah. you don't meet all three, even if you meet two, but one is missing, <laughs> it's not safe to go with those casual pronouns. Yeah, the other get out that I sometimes use is, is that you, if you if you know someone well enough to have the conversation, so mm -hmm. could, do you think I could call you me? If you know them well enough to ask them that, then it's probably okay. That's but that's quite a good one. Yeah, I because, often I often ask this the person um well is that the kind of person that you feel comfortable calling up to pick you up at three o'clock in the morning at the airport or <laughs> if you have that kind of relationship then maybe yeah. it's safe to oh, say yeah <laughs> otherwise really maybe good, you, so. re <laughs> you re-examine it yeah what are the, the other thing i encourage students to do so is is that mm -hmm. um, 
because the, you know just getting a handle on all the varieties of of pronouns and sort of words used as pronouns like in terms that people use it's quite interesting to ask Burmese people, you know, what do you call that person? What do they call you? Actually, just to get a sense of the repertoire, the possible repertoire. So if you're, if you're out with a Burmese friend, saying, what do you call your mother? What do you call the neighbours? What do you call your teacher? What do you call your parents' friends? You know, all of those things. What are the, what are the options? And you can get a sense of, uh, of the variety of different um, forms of yeah. address that people are using in their daily lives all the time. And then yeah. you get a, a bit of a handle on the the repertoire that you can you can start building, start drawing on, um, to address people. <laughs> it goes to the heart, I think, of uh, the importance of listening to natural, authentic conversations. Uh, mm. uh, for somebody who lives um, outside the country, it may be difficult to get that kind of exposure. But I would say YouTube is a good source. Yeah. Looking at Burmese, uh, watching Burmese bloggers, uh, how they talk about themselves, uh, pay attention to the pronouns that they use when they are referring to other people. You might notice, for example, older, uh, slightly older women when talking to a younger woman will call themselves as mama and refer to the younger person as nyama. And you might not even realize that that is actually an option when you're speaking. Yeah. 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 The other thing that's interesting, actually, to come back very briefly to Google Translate, Google Translate is very fond of the pronoun thing for you, which is, of course, the most sort of impersonal, you know, the yeah. kind of thing you might get in instruction on a piece of machinery or something like that. It's totally impersonal Correct. and very inhuman. Um, yeah. But people who use Google Translate suddenly start using thin all the time. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> I, I see that uh, pronoun thin, that in reality, very few native speaker would use and you'll have to go back to like a, a feudal era kind of uh, books and poetry to see the word thin to see it yeah but i see that cropping up in commercials a lot yeah and i think that it's because copywriters do a direct translation and they really don't know what to replace the you with um yeah i think you get it in you know in a you know what if it's an, like an advertising that kind of thing you know you you yeah. can where, where um some sort of inhuman abstract entity is addressing the reader of a of an advertisement you might get thin for that or you know instructions about how to use um a lift in a building or something like that you might get thin right something like um thin say easy but something like that <laughs> I hear that in a commercial, and I'm thinking, hmm, well, nobody actually in reality will say that sort of thing. Yeah, who's talking to who here? And the point is, that, yeah, no, it's it's a non-human talking to a human, I guess. Yeah. It's because uh, the copywriter or whoever is doing the translation did a direct translation, but they might not realize that in natural language, people usually drop the you altogether in a saying like that. So. Yeah. They could simply say "bawashi ye say ezebo" rather than "thin bawashi ye say ezebo," which is really awkward to me. It is. It sounds really weird. I think actually another time we we probably shouldn't get onto the issue of translation here, but it will be a really good topic for another broadcast another time because yeah. you've I've done a lot of translating in my um, career and you have too, and I think we that would be a really good conversation that people might might enjoy listening to. We'll, we'll we'll think about that uh, in our fodder for for the next broadcast. Um, I guess we'll move on to then. We've already we're already drifting into it. So let's talk about the difficulties. What do you think are uh, um, the things that Burmese learners need help with the most? We're doing we're doing good. I think uh, we're at the eighty four um, forty four minutes mark to the hour. Okay. Yeah. Um. Shall I go first? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, what, so what, what do people find difficult? I think they find difficult um, persevering at the beginning because, you know, I, I, it's unhelpful to think of Burmese as intrinsically difficult. You know, that doesn't help. It's just a human language. All human languages have things that are more or less different from what you started with. Um, so I don't think that's very helpful. I think it is, however, a language where if your starting point is English or a, lang or a European language like English, um, then there are a number of hurdles that you have to get over at the beginning, which are quite boring. You know, learning the script, you've got to do it, but it's a bit, 
you know, it's it's not it's a bit of a thankless task for quite a while. Learning pronunciation is quite fiddly. You need to keep your eye on the ball and have an eye for detail. And it takes quite a lot. And, and then when you start forming sentences, the verbs, you know, you have to be able to do quite a lot with the syntax of verbs in Burmese before you can say anything <laughs> that's useful. So there's quite it's quite a long time before you can sort of go out and put your Burmese to use um, with confidence and say, you know, produce messages that are going to be useful for communicative purposes. So it sort of needs to stay in the lab for quite a long time, or some of it needs to stay in the lab for a long time. And that's, I think that can be discouraging for many people. But once you get above, over that sort of first hill, shall we say, then there is a, you know, a sunny plain um, of uh, relative, you know, you can, a, a plateau, uh, a level that where your Burmese can be really quite useful for all sorts of things. And once you get there, then I think things um, can feel a bit more um, encouraging. Um, and if you, you know, let's say, compare Burmese to a language like Thai, and there are quite a few people who, you know, know a bit of both languages. Um, with Thai, you have the script and you have the, the tones and all that kind of thing. You need to do that detailed stuff. But once the syntax is quite similar to English, so that once you learn a few Thai words, you can just go out and say stuff and it works. Whereas in Burmese, that's not always the case for quite a while. So I think that that I think is one of the hardest things that you just have to keep going for a little bit longer before you're released um, and able to do useful stuff with the language and say stuff that you mean. And that's frustrating for lots of people, I think. To me, it seems like one of the difficulty, and that is certainly a difficulty for English speakers and people who learn a Latin-based kind of language, is just that the grammatical structure in Burmese to them seems the reverse. Yeah. Um, location markers and possession markers, things like that, they come after the noun, not before the noun. So. Uh, um, things like going to Yangon, you actually in Burmese have to say Yangon too, because the marker is going to come afterwards. And that kind of backward thinking, some of the students will say, yeah, everything is backward. I can't deal with this. So, and that's a real challenge. I have a lot of sympathy for that. That's not easy for the brain to do that kind of switch. Well, I think you have to say, yes, it is backwards, but you can handle it. You know, there's nothing, it's, it's, you, you know, with, with practice, you can do it. Um, and of course, occasionally, I'm sure you've taught students with a Japanese language background or pe people who know Japanese. Yes. Um, and of course, they just glide into Burmese and can translate right. words. Word because they again. do it exactly like that in their native yeah. language. That's and true. as well, it's very similar. So, you know, there it is, you know, you have to... If you're going to organize words in a sentence in a language, you've got to put them this way around or this way around. And it just so happens that Burmese is the other way around from English. But that's the only thing. It's just a different order. And once you know the rules, you apply the rules. And with familiarity, of course, that's the important thing. The more you um, entrench the repeated and very, very common patterns of how a Burmese sentence is formed, then, you know, it's fine. Um, and one of the best ways to to get around that, I think, is you know, I've been doing a lot of reading classes where, of course, in written Burmese, the sentences can get very long and very complex. And learning to pick your way around a long, convoluted Burmese sentence um, is quite a satisfying skill to pick up. But very often, even if the sentence is like the whole paragraph, you could, it's often faster to start at the end and read backwards. <laughs> and something that comes out much more naturally that way around. Great. Um, because in Burmese sentences, the last word that occurs is usually the action word, the verb, yeah, verb what yeah. somebody does to somebody. So usually, if you're an English speaker, you're likely to want to understand what's happening first. So you go to the last of the sentence and work your way backward. Um, there is actually somebody was asking um, about the difficulty of breaking down long sentences. I, I One of the tips I give them is um, identify conjunction words like dabi me or though in the literal, literary version. The conjunction tells you that there are two parts to this thought, and if you can break it down, you can actually figure out the first part first, and then the second part first, and then make sense of how the two fit together using the conjunction. If the conjunction is dabi me, then the speaker is telling a contrasting idea between those two long, convoluted things. The other things in there may be adjectives like colors and uh, 
the heat of the day and things like that, that you sort of have to slowly work your way through it. And of course, sorry, as a side note there, we, we are remembering that there are no adjectives in Burmese. Yeah, they don't exist, <laughs> really. Well, um, a, a few it, 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 that's right. Uh, when I start teaching students, the, in my very first lesson, I'll talk to them about the survival of verbs. And then they'll, they'll hear me say a word like ude, which is to be hot in Burmese, which is a verb if you look it up in a Burmese dictionary. But in English way of thinking, they are saying, why are you, why is this Burmese teacher calling hot a verb and not an adjective? Does this guy not understand English grammar or something? Yeah. Well, I think too, we do have to, we, we can play the, um, you know, we can consider the um, Orientalism again. You know, the, it, one of the problems is that the dominating um, way of describing language is based on the, anal the analysis of European languages, um, and which often gets imported. And sometimes people's understanding of how to of language pedagogy is all about learning English and the categories that are used for English, and they get somehow um, imported and applied to Burmese, and they don't fit. Um, and and so we should not use them. You know, it's not helpful. You know, even a word like preposition implies a European structure of something that That's was right. like before. And in Burmese, we mustn't say that. It's not a preposition. It's a postposition. It's a postposition. Some other name. That's um, true. And I think you know it. It, it is very unhelpful um, to describe Burmese in terms that are designed for a language with a very different structure. Um, and we should get good at defining Burmese in its own terms. And so another example of that, I think, is uh, um, tenses. You know, European tenses are a European language thing. We have lots mm -hmm. of them in English. Um, I can't remember twenty or something ridiculous. Um, and European languages require you to just have this huge matrix of tenses in your head. And Burmese doesn't do tenses. You know, it just doesn't arrange the the doesn't handle the expression of time and relative the, you know, the relation of one event to another using tenses it just doesn't right. do it that way. you have de me and be and that's it you know you have these three categories which aren't really tenses and that works for the whole language and i think right. you have the um you know casually of course you can say present and past and that kind of thing but it's not really helpful to persist in 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 trying to shoehorn burmese into categories which don't fit it so try not to do it Okay. Yeah, I think that is also another difficulty. It's, some instructors call it the transfer problem, the problem of a learner's tendency to transfer the native language grammar onto the new language that they are learning. If I taught somebody, if I teach somebody that the particle ke mark <laughs> events that have happened before, then the speaker is going to mark everything that happened in the past with sa get it, ma get it, la get but, but the reality is, in reality, native speakers don't do that. They are more likely to indicate that thing, this event has already happened by throwing in a word like manega, yesterday. Yeah. So if they say manega kalswe sare, that would be sufficient for them. Very few of them were very likely to say manega kalswe sare because that sounds... Well, it depends what's in your mind, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the last remaining seven minutes or so, shall we perhaps share the resources that we thought would be helpful? Yes, to that's this? a great idea. Yeah. So yeah, you go first. What's your what's your fav favorite thing? Well, the first thing, and I suspect that that is on your list as well. That is actually uh, Sia John O'Kell's Burmese. <laughs> that's right. We <laughs> both have <laughs> I'm a form that Always has been that. very helpful uh, for the teachers as well as for the learners. For the learners looking up why sudden structures work the way it is for the teachers, how to explain these. And the other thing that I find is that if you're an advanced level, I think books by uh, Mount Kim in Danubiu, Mount Kim mm -hmm. in Danubiu, is very helpful because he goes into quirky things like the vowel, uh, the consonant shifting that happened. Mm -hmm. Why do you read these words this way, even though they are spelled that way? Things like that. Uh, and intermediate level, I maybe this is a bit of an off topic, but I recommend something like the poetry translation because there are actually contemporary poems, contemporary poems written side by side in English and Burmese. So if you're sort of an intermediate learner, 
it's good to be able to see the comparison in the way English language works and Burmese language works and mm. compare notes. So I have some more, but why don't you go as well? Um, I haven't got anything to hand actually now, so, but let me think. Um, what do I like? The dictionaries. We should talk about dictionaries a little bit. Yes. And yes. I, oh, hold on, I'm going to have to stand up very yes. briefly. Uh, by all means. Okay. Yes. My yes. So, sorry, I'm still here. Right. So, the dictionary, uh, one of the dictionaries that's quite hard to get hold of at the moment, um, but which is small and compact and is quite good, is this one. I don't know if you recommend you that. You mean this one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got matching bookshelves. <laughs> um, and um, but as you'll know, there are some. There are a couple of design flaws in my mind in this for this dictionary. So, for example, if you look up um, the English adjective red, um, you would normally expect to find the Burmese verb mide because okay. that's one of the things that you just deal with from day one with Burmese that, as we said before, English adjectives are Burmese verbs. Um, and in this book, it'll give you a relative clause that means something like, which is red. So it's quite dispiriting when students use this um, dictionary without knowing quite enough Burmese to know how to handle themselves, that they'll say ni dobade instead of ni bade. Yeah, so there's, right, and there's right. a couple of other things. So with some caveats, this is a great, certainly in terms of scope and size and usability, it's great. But the other one, of course, is this dictionary, which is the, um, have you got that one? <laughs> the new, yeah, there we go. Yeah, we've both got it. You've got the new, a newer one. There's, so the Myamaza Apoe, I think it's from 93 dictionary, which is Burmese to English. And probably good enough for 90 percent of what you might want to look up ever it's really good and it is a, the data is available online at the sealang.net website um, and that website is especially useful because it means you can use the dictionary in both directions you can look up english words as well and it's also got attached to it some a really good sort of corpus function and a uh, also a corpus of paired um, Burmese sentences with their English translations that you can search and they're invaluable for looking up grammar words which otherwise are, are quite hard to get uh, a handle on. So if you want to look up a word like van, if you're interested in how comparisons work, you could look up van in the paired English and Burmese sentences and see how it works and it sets them out for you in a really, really easy to digest way. So that's a brilliant, one of the best places to, to use. And there are a load of other dictionaries too that's you might need for different purposes but if i think if you're going to have two only these two would be a good start for people who are learning the language away from the country itself for immerse immersion purpose what do you recommend people check out i i hesitate to recommend burmese movies because to be honest the the quality of the cinematography and also the kind of story that they tell tends to be highly problematic in the way they be really high, yeah. in the way they treat um kind of uh it's, there are a lot of old-fashioned thinking that shows up shall we say yeah and just often the sound quality is quite bad and mm -hmm. often the editing is quite bad i mean there are you know not always but there there aren't many subtitled movies out there either and it's a shame there aren't more movies subtitled um, in burmese that would be useful um mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know. I tend in teaching, I tend to um, not use much stuff off the internet um, because it just you, you, it takes up a lot of time. Um, and I think, yeah, as yeah, directing people to stuff to stuff online that they can explore is good. But a surprising amount of Burmese language material out there is not always that useful for for learning because it needs curating. You know, needs, um, True. Yeah. But in, in my class, I do uh, from time to time use telephone commercial. They seem mm -hmm. to be pretty compact and they have a little story built in into itself of the family situation and things like that. Yeah. And do use a whole lot of difficult words. So it's easy for beginning level students to digest. And um, yeah. the photography is pretty good as well. Radio phone-in shows can be quite good because they're very repetitive. They can be they can be quite fun, um, right. and they're quite a good way of tuning into um, a large variety of different different voices, which is a useful thing to do. 
Um, so I occasionally do that. There's um, a slightly more advanced learners. There's the Teacup Diaries, which is a BBC so radio soap. Is it BBC? Yeah. Um, which is great. That's really good. Um, uh, BBC um, BBC Burmese version. Uh, there is a program. I'm sorry to say that I I haven't seen new episodes showing up lately. It's called Alenga Paleba. Alenga Paleba uh, is a program that talks about uh, the the strange origin of certain words and. Oh uh, uh, yes, yeah, no, yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, but that's certainly not recommended for beginners because yeah. everything is in Burmese and they are talking about the history of the word. So. You'll have to be an advanced learner to be able to understand those. Um, but the new, I think that you know, listening to um, the internet, because it's quite you know what happens at the beginning and the way news items are formulated is quite repetitive, Correct. and that can, that can be good and good for general vocabulary. Sure. True. Um, our time is uh, up, I'm afraid, Sia. Thank you very much for joining with me today, and I hope we can do it again. On yes, thank time. you, Sia. It was um, fun. Yeah, I feel we could keep on <laughs> chatting for a long time, but we should probably yes. stop. And to, to the people who are tuning in, uh, we really appreciate your attention and your uh, time. This is the first time we are doing it. Um, if this is helpful, we'll do more of this. And then I promise you that after we disconnect, we'll go back, read the comments, and then whenever, whatever that we can, we'll address in writing. So, yeah, I hope you okay. can. Yeah, I hope you can. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. Okay. Namaste, Owen, Osia. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.